that we do not doubt. You are saturated with mercy, compassion, goodness, and generosity, that we do not doubt. We are nonetheless haunted by the witness that you are a God with a ferocious will who will not be mocked. We are vexed by the awareness that when you are mocked, you pluck up and tear down. So we ponder about your ferocious will you're being mocked and you're plucking up and tearing down. And we wonder in what ways we have mocked you and in what ways you do your ferocious work. We watch and wonder if you pluck up. We notice the ways in which our world is being plucked up by the roots. Our institutions on which we have relied, our incertitudes that no longer seem to hold our entitlements that we can't any longer protect our growth economy, that we can no longer cause to grow. We wonder and watch if you tear down, we notice the ways in which you are, there is a tearing down among us, our security systems, our social infrastructure that makes life possible, our solidity in church for which we can hardly pay anymore. And then we remember that in ancient days you plucked up your people out of the land, you tore down your Messiah on that dread Friday, you put your people into free fall twice, more than twice, many more times than twice, with brutality and fear and greed and eye tie neighborless and injustice. We are vexed and haunted by what we know of you and so we pause now to think about old texts, to think about present circumstance. We ask you to pluck up our systems of greed and anxiety, to dare tear down old walls of fear and exclusion, to begin a new filled with Easter dance. We find ourselves on that Saturday of plucking up and tearing down. We notice and we wonder, and if it is not too soon, we hope. Amen. Amen. 
Well, I'm going to uh, um, give you a, a few books if you're interested in Jeremiah, and then uh, I'll take a little time to see whether you want to ask about anything we talked about, because I'm sure you've thought of nothing else since we were <laughs> last together. Uh, I, I got uh, five books, and uh, if you're interested in them. Uh, this is by my friend Louis Stuhlman, who teaches at Finley University. Uh, the subtitle is Jeremiah as a Symbolic Tapestry. It's about the structure and shape of the book of Jeremiah. Uh, uh, this is a commentary by Jorge Pixley. Uh, on Jeremiah, it is uh, uh, from a liberation perspective. Uh, this is written by my, this is the best recent book on Jeremiah. This is by my colleague Kathleen O'Connor. It's called Jeremiah, Pain and Promise. She reads the book of Jeremiah through uh, theories of post-trauma stress syndrome in which she makes the argument that only people in that syndrome could have produced this literature, the trauma being the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, this is my book called The Theology of the Book of Jeremiah, and this is my commentary on the Book of Jeremiah, which is uh, not better than other commentaries, but it is as good as the other commentaries. <laughs> so I would uh, invite you to read one of these others and buy that one. <laughs> You can't ever get away from economic questions. <laughs> well, let me, uh, let me see whether there are uh, things we talked about or things you've read or thought since uh, you'd like to uh, uh, probe. Yes? You had raised that question when we left about the church very departing. Identify what um, the work of the church is. What is the work of the church in, in the light of all we share? So and what do you what do you think? Well, I guess one of the first thoughts that I had was, and, and uh, with our everybody's insight here, I don't know that in the crisis we've been going through now, has there been any spokesperson uh, like for any of the leadership positions in any of the churches? I don't recall any. It's like we see the vets who are, uh, you know, there, yep. and it, but I don't recall anything that's come from any of the churches. Well, the church doesn't get reported in the media unless it says something about sex. <laughs> so the, the media, the media doesn't want to notice what the church might say. You know, all of our all of our denominational offices have said a lot, and uh, there there is a there is a literature about it, but it doesn't get noticed. Okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. We're also sometimes afraid to be too, to sound like we're taking sides, because then your church can lose its donors. Donors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. But to speak with what you said, um, I think we need to remember that the Pope is speaking up right now. Yes. That's right. That's right. That's right. Kind of uh, um, picking up on uh, what some Protestants have been saying for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dave Dreisbach told me today that there was a, a, um, a scene on the Colbert Report in which this guy had has written a book about Francis and the new church. And uh, he talked about what Francis was doing, and Colbert said, you mean that people are more important than rules now? <laughs> and he said, yes. And Colbert said, well, how come we're Episcopalians? <laughs> <laughs> yep. So uh, stuff is happening. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes? I was just waiting for my friend. Oh. <laughs> Good. Well, 
Uh, let me, uh, a, a few of you I think were not here last week, so it's a, a quick uh, summary in which I said that the uh, history behind the book of Jeremiah has to do with the crisis of the destruction of Jerusalem uh, that required a lot of interpretation, reflection, and anticipation. And I suggested that symbolically 9-11 uh, is our social equivalent in which 9-11 uh, has become uh, a metaphor for the undoing of the old world. And uh, then I uh, suggested that uh, out of Jeremiah 1.10 that the, the one way to understand the book of Jeremiah is that uh, Jeremiah's vocation is to uh, pluck up and tear down and plant and build. And then I showed you uh, four other texts where that same set of verbs uh, is used in a variety of ways to help give shape to the book of Deuteronomy. And then I suggested that the pluck up and tear down is to uh, walk Jerusalem into the loss of 587 and to uh, plant and to build uh, is to uh, walk Jerusalem out of 587 and the hard thing about plucking up and tearing down is that Jeremiah had to do that in a society of denial uh, that didn't want to know they were walking into that abyss and planting and building is very hard uh, because this was a society in despair and they did not believe that anything could happen. Now this uh, really is the uh, structure of most of the prophetic books. Uh, so you will find particularly in the three big books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, they're all organized this way even though they don't, they don't use this kind of language. Uh, and, uh, so that, that, and then I think I said at the end that if you take that pattern and see the four verbs that way, uh, this is really retold in the life of Jesus. So this becomes crucifixion and this becomes resurrection. Uh, and uh, obviously the, the uh, shapers of the Jesus narrative uh, knew all of this uh, very well. So uh, tonight, the hard part, uh, let's see. I thought I had removed all that stuff. Oh, that's all right. The hard part is to talk about plucking up and tearing down. If you, if you have your Bible, you just want to take a peek at 110 so you can see those verbs together. Uh, in 110, there are four negative verbs, pluck up and tear down, destroy and overthrow. But these are the two that then uh, get pursued through much of the book. And my understanding of that part of 110 is that it is an act what follows is an act of artistic imagination of walking Jerusalem in its imagination ahead of time into 587 and the, the prophets are uh, resilient in insisting uh, that the crisis of 587 did not happen because of careless leadership. It did not happen because of Babylonian expansionism. It did not happen by a random act. Uh, it happened uh, uh, by the agency of Yahweh. Now, what this prophet and all of the prophets do is that they do not uh, do this directly. They use image and metaphor. Uh, and one of the problems in the long history of interpretation is that we've taken images and metaphors and tried to turn them into prose. And every time you do that, you're going to misunderstand it. So the, the use of image and metaphor, it's not direct, uh, it's not didactic, and it is mostly not a bid for repentance. The, 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 this language doesn't ask Israel for the most part to do anything. It just is a, a kind of an imaginative explosion. For God's sake, do you see what's happening? And what I'm going to do tonight is to walk around uh, four such 
images or metaphors, um, and uh, I'll take just take some trouble because I think the the really good work and the really hard work is uh, really uh, reading these texts as such. So the first one uh, has to do with the image and metaphor of marriage, and uh, the, the use of the uh, of the image uh, 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 metaphor of marriage is very patriarchal and uh, uh, most uh, feminist scholars would say you ought not to talk that way. Uh, you know how, how we use the marriage imagery. I was in a uh, or no, it wasn't here. We, last week I was somewhere where we sang the church is one foundation. You remember the second verse from heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride and for her something he died. Well you see the, the bride, the church is the bride and Christ is the husband. Uh, and of course that's picked up then in Ephesians instruction. Uh, and the, the, the problem with that uh, is that in a patriarchal society the husband is always in the right. So God is a husband who is always in the right and uh, the wife doesn't come off so well. Now Hosea, Hosea is a hundred years uh, before Jeremiah. So look at Hosea 2. This is a kind of a master text uh, for, uh, and I figured I could do that. I figured uh, we'll all get paid the same as long as we're talking about some text. <laughs> Hosea 2. Hosea is uh, right after Ezekiel. Ezekiel's the last big prophet, and if you get to Matthew, you've gone too far. <laughs> By 11, you've gone too far. So Hosea 2, uh, we'll just scan it. Uh, beginning in verse 2, 2-2, two, two, it's a divorce case. Plead, in verse 2, means go to court. Uh, everybody got Hosea? Yes. Okay. Uh, and, and and tell her I'm leaving. You know that in the in the ancient Near East, uh, a man could divorce uh, his wife just by saying, "I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you," and he walked out. He had, he had no legal thing to do. He just, "I'm not your husband anymore." Uh, and then um, he goes on to, to tell what she did wrong. You, she said, he tells the court. This is all poetry. Uh, she said, verse five, "I will go after my lovers." That could be other gods, or it could be other foreign nations. Uh, because my lovers gave me bread and water and wool and flax. And then, therefore, so the other one was therefore. Therefore means big trouble coming. Therefore, if I read it that way, therefore I will hedge up her way with thorns so that she cannot find a path and she will go after her lovers but she won't find them and then she said I will go and return to my first husband that's Yahweh for it was better than I thought but she didn't know that I'm the one who gave her grain wine and oil olive oil and silver and gold therefore I will take back my grain and I will take back my wine and I will take back my wool and my flax and I will make her naked in humiliation, and I will uncover her shame when she's sleeping around and copulating with everybody. I will make Jerusalem a forest, not Jerusalem and Samaria. I will punish her. So I'm leaving. That's the end of the divorce case, verse 13. Verse 14, therefore, <laughs> except that it's a rhetorical trick, Verse 14 does a U-turn. Therefore, I will seduce her. I will whisper sweet nothings in her ear. And I will, uh, I will, I will remove the name 17, the balls from her mouth. And I will make with you a new covenant and I will abolish war and I will make you lie down in well-being. Now what I particularly want you to see is verses 19 and 20. This is Yahweh talking according to Hosea. I will take you again, I will take you Israel for my wife in righteousness, mark that verse, justice, steadfast love, 
mercy and faithful. It's a wedding vow. And the wedding vow consists in all five big covenantal words in the Old Testament. If you get those five words, you got it. It means to keep your vows like wedding vows of loyalty. And then the last three verses in poetry say creation will go again. So what I want you to see is that the text is divided into a divorce case. And then you have to pause a long time between verse 13 and 14 for Yahweh to change Yahweh's mind. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not be angry, but I'm going to invite her back and we're going to live in faithfulness. Now, what I want to say about that is that uh, Jeremiah had this poem. Hosea is 100 years before. So Jeremiah knew this poem. And what he wants to talk about is that 587 happened because Israel, the wife of Yahweh, acted like a whore. And there were two ways in prophetic imagination of being a whore. One is to worship false gods, uh, which leads to false social policy. And the other one is to make alliances with foreign powers when you should have been relying on Yahweh to guarantee your life. So uh, that's what he does. And, and this, this long poem in Jeremiah now, verses 2-1 to 4-4, is simply this poet walking around the metaphor of marriage. So I said to you at the beginning that the book of Jeremiah is not really history. It's removed from history, and it's an act of artistic imagination. So I think when we read it in our contemporary setting, we have this act of imagination from Jeremiah, and when we read it, we commit an act of imagination out of this act of imagination in order to help it, us, to let it help us imagine how we are to understand our own time and place, if you like, as a context of whoredom in which we have been unfaithful uh, to the purposes and covenant of God. So that's kind of how I set that up. Now, I don't know, I'll, I'll stop there a minute to see whether you want to respond to how I'm trying to work with images and metaphors and see how that goes for you. You're, you're like seminarians, avoid eye contact. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm connecting this with what you said last week about Job representing Israel. Yeah. 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 Uh, Job, Job doesn't so directly represent Israel as is done here, uh, but it helps to read it that way because you can help then why the, the poetry might have been written. Yep. Well, take a look at this then. And, uh, yes. Yes, please. Sir, I don't mean to be disrespectful in any way. Well, I didn't think you were. Well, no, I, I really have a problem. And I, I, maybe I saw this last week also. Why are we categorizing these women as whores? Well, I said to you, I said to you it's a huge problem. Well, that's and, my problem also. I know. And well, what I want to do, what I want to do is to try to read the poem with understanding and then talk about how we are to handle it given our common awareness of the problem. But I don't, I don't, I don't. Maybe that's my problem. What's the problem? Why are they calling these women? Be because it's a patriarchal society. The Bible. Well, well, we live in one now. But my question to you, and, and again, I, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I, I'm not worried about that. <laughs> but again, we're, we're looking at the Bible as women, they have no role. They have no role. Well, that's, that's not quite true, but I well, take your point. I, I know. I'm, I'm, yep. I'm, I'm new at all. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me, let me give you two titles of good scholars uh, who, who have 
tried to deal with this. One is Renita Weems, who has taught at Vanderbilt, and her, the title of her book is Battered Love. It's an attack on patriarchal images. The other one, I don't remember the title, but it's by Julie O'Brien, who teaches at Lancaster Seminary. So there is a flood of literature agreeing with you, and I share it. I edited Renita Weems' book. I, I think these texts are hugely problematic, but I think that before we can deal with the problematic, we have to see what they say. And, and then my lesson plan would be, after we get that, and after we see the problem with it, then we need to write new poems that try to reiterate what this poet is saying, but to say it in other metaphors. Mm. And you see, well, I, w I, I, I don't want to soften your critique, uh, but, but the Bible is problematic about many things. It's problematic about violence. It's problematic about slavery. Uh, some few parts of it are problematic about homosexuality, though there aren't many, really many very texts. But then, so it, it's problematic because, to some extent, uh, what they want to say about God is filtered through a cultural lens. Correct. And we don't share that cultural lens, but it's, it's like reading any ancient literature. You ought to first try to understand what the literature seems to be doing, and then critique it and move away from it, or, or decide you don't want to read it at all. That's okay too, but, but it seems to me the first step is to try to take it seriously. But that's, again sir, I, I absolutely understand what you're saying, and that's why I'm here, because I think that you're taking this in a very um, historical, yes. as opposed to maybe so. more of a the, theological. I, I like the, the... Well, it's a lot of implied theology. Well, that may be too. But let me, tell you, let me tell you the importance of doing this. If you were to read this text in church, you know what would happen? Everybody would say, the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. <laughs> mm. we, we, are, we are so desensitized. We, we read some terrible text two weeks ago, and we all said, thanks be to God. I thought, why are we grateful? Well, we're grateful because we didn't listen. Sir, this, but that's not why. I'm here to learn. Okay. You and, will. And I've, I've listened to you, and I really haven't seen anything that I really disagree with. But... Well, you don't have to agree with it. Oh, well, what I'm saying is I don't disagree. Right? That doesn't mean yeah, I agree. Yeah. But that being said, what I find, and, and I'm going to get back to my main point, is the role of women and how how the Bible talks of them. And, and you have said, and, and I'm not saying that you are saying that, I'm saying what you're interpreting the Bible is saying as they're whores and, and you have I'm not interpreting the Bible, that's what it says. Okay, yeah. so that's fine. Yeah. I have a problem with that. I have a problem with it too. But, but we don't help ourselves by closing the book. But we don't help ourselves by saying that all men at that time thought women were whores. No, no, I, di I didn't say that. I said it is a dominant cultural assumption, just like it has been a dominant cultural assumption in our very own lifetime until very recently that homosexuality was a lethal sin. We didn't all agree with that, but it was a dominant assumption. It is the dominant assumption now that the U.S. ought to go to war everywhere, anytime, and many people think torture is all right. That's a dominant assumption. We are, we are by and large, we are dissenters. And I am with you in dissenting from this way of thinking. <laughs> I, I don't know what to say other than I just don't like the fact that we're looking through the lens, and I think you said this last week, which I, I really loved your lecture last week, that we're looking through the lens of one person doing one thing 
and having one idea. But that doesn't mean that that's the idea for everyone. That's correct. And I really love that. But, and this is why, this is why the Bible is so varied and why we have four Gospels. The early church did not agree on the Jesus narrative. So they put four of them in. And if you read the crucifixion story of Jesus or the resurrection, you get four completely different narratives. But we listen so carelessly that we don't notice. And all, all, I'm, all I'm wanting to do is to engage in a practice of paying attention. And then after we pay attention, we need to have lots of conversations about this. Can you live with that for the moment? I have to live with it for another, at least another 15, 20 minutes. Well, good. Now you, I think we got a little more than that. I can probably live with it for the rest of your life. Okay. That's all I'd ask you to do. And I'm, not, I'm not asking you to agree with the text nor my interpretation of it. But th what this is, w w what, I, what I want to do tonight is just a, just a little exercise in how we might read. And, and so what, what you have to keep in mind, this, this business of image and metaphor means what he's really talking about is 587, but he's talking about it in these categories, so there's lots of slippage between this and this. The, 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 the point of it all is to say Jerusalem was destroyed because they did not practice covenantal fidelity. But you see, if you just said Jerusalem was destroyed because you did not practice covenantal fidelity, you'd pretty soon get on a talk show and be dismissed. Oh, we heard that now. So poetry, poetry, image, metaphor, is an attempt to get underneath our first knee-jerk reaction. I don't know whether you noticed in, in the prayer I used, I very carefully used the word, we are haunted and we are vexed. That, that's, that's not an outcome, because I don't know what else to say about it, but I think these poems if we pay attention to them, might haunt us, and they might vex us, but they don't lead to a new package of certitudes. Come back at that if you want to. If you want to, I'm not. I'm, I am. I am not. I am not putting you on the spot. But but I. No, Okay. Does anybody else want in on this? Yes. When she was addressing you. Sometimes when she said it wasn't right and the yep. women, as if you wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't your fault. Well, I, I, I have been in a few places where people didn't have my book, so they asked me to autograph the Bible, and I always say I didn't write it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, political things through all the Bible, there were political things, cultural oh, yeah. things, spiritual things, yeah. and we've moved beyond yeah. the historical to some degree and the cultural. <clears throat> we're not in that culture. That's right. But what we're left with is the spiritual. Yeah. We're, well, we're left with more than the spiritual. We're left with the political and the economic. Really? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. Well, we're not. Because we're covenantal, not, covenantal. Women should stop talking in the church. Pardon me? Women should stop talking in the church. Why would we stop talking in the church? Why women should stop talking in the church. Oh. Well, it's a, it's, a politi it's a covenantal political issue that women should have equal voice. Correct. So that's a political question. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Yes and yes. What, and what yes. was the name of the other author after Renita Wayne? Julie, Julie O'Brien. Julie, I knew she was Irish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes, Father, well, I think the biggest problem I had when I was a pastor in, 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 in churches was that people, for some reason, thought that the Bible was written to the United States of America yep. and that it was, it was, and they forgot that these, it's an ancient text and it has to be, first of all, you have to know who, who's talking, yep. to whom they're talking, yep. the setting, and all of that. And that was one of the hardest things that I had in, a, in preaching or teaching, either one, to get across was this is different in, in many respects. 
you you don't you can't even think like they're thinking. That's right. That's right. Because of, of the, the, the the problem is, you know, David, it's also true in the New Testament. Right. And what we want the Jesus story to be intimately comfortable for us. But it is as strange and odd in different ways as is the Old Testament. Yeah, I heard someone say, you know, we point our finger sure. at, at, the, at the Muslims and say, how weird, how weird. And, and we say, our, our Messiah was born of a virgin? Yep. You know? Yep. Uh, so, yep, that's right. Uh, that's right. Yes? Very tiny question. There is a principle of when something happened first in the Bible that sets the precedent. So I'm going to display my ignorance. Which was written first, Ezekiel, uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah? The, 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 the assumption is that Hosea, or Amos is first, Hosea, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Yeah. And that's a big confuser to most uh, right. American yeah. students. Yeah. That they think the Bible was yeah. laid out just yeah. but, but, but the big prophetic books have an elongated construction, so they are being written over several generations. Mm -hmm. So you have early Isaiah, middle Isaiah, late Isaiah, and that's what you have in Jeremiah as well. Yeah. So. Okay. Yes? Am I right back to the lady's question? The whore in this case is not the female population no. of Israel. No. It is that's right. Politically speaking, Israel. That's correct. That's right. But 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 that that's the trickiness of a metaphor. You, you, uh, a metaphor, uh, so they say, has two parts. It has a vehicle, and it has a tenor. The vehicle is that the woman is a whore. The tenor is that Israel is the whore. The problem with metaphors is even though you want to talk about the tenor, that is the metaphorical reference, you never completely get free of the concrete reference. And I think, ma'am, I think that's your point. You never get free of the concrete reference. Yep. I, I understand what you're saying. I'm not an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> There's a I didn't think so. No, 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 I'm not saying you did. Yep. Okay. And, and I apologize for not making this, or, or for telling you how, the way I feel in a correct manner. There's a right and a wrong as I see it. Not that you're saying that. I understand. There's a right and a wrong. Here's the right male, here's the wrong woman. I understand. And, and, that, and that's the way it is coming across. And, and the Bible has been used that way. Exactly. Yeah. So and what I want to do. Is, and I agree with the gentleman who yep. previously said. Yep. Yep. I agree with all that. Yep. But the woman is 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 taken to be, and I'm not, I, trust me, I'm not trying to make this a feminist thing because mm -hmm. I don't even know if I believe in that. But the way this has come across is that the woman is the wrong. That's correct. That's right. That's that's how it's been in a. That is how it's been in a patriarchal society, even un, even until our own time. But not in my family, because we're well, my mother and we were amazing. Well, good for you. <laughs> that would yield a different set of poems. So let me let me tell you the reason I've let this conversation go on is that you are not the only one here that is interested in this hard question, I'm sorry. and it's the question that we need to talk about. Yes. But you see, the question doesn't come up if we don't talk about the poems. So thank you. Okay? I'll breeze along here a minute. So if you look at chapter 2, Jeremiah now. I, start, I started to go ahead and comment even while I had my Bible open to Hosea 2, which reminds me that Paul Tillich, the great theologian, was a uh, he loved to find theology and art, and he was doing a slide show one day, and uh, a slide came up with a line on it, and he started uh, explaining that this was the ark of God's grace until the projectionist said, that's a hair on the lens. So, you know, it's, uh, 
<laughs> so, so the way the metaphor works, in 2.2, two, God says, I remember the devotion, and that's, a, that, that's the word that we translate covenantal fidelity, of your youth. When you were a bride, we had a wonderful honeymoon, and you followed me everywhere. Because, you know, in a patriarchal society, the woman follows the man. And then he says in verse 4, but what went wrong? You didn't follow me, but you went far from me, and you went after worthless things. That means bad gods or something. And if you do that, you become worthless. So here's the specificity. Your ancestors did not say, where is Yahweh who caused the exodus and gave us the land? Your ancestors forgot the narrative. Verse 8, the priests did not say, where's Yahweh? They forgot to talk about Yahweh. Those who interpret the Torah have forgotten God. The power people have transgressed. The prophets have signed on with false gods and went after things. So you got the, the scribes, the rabbis, the kings, the prophets, the whole leadership class has been deluded. You see, now we're not talking about women. We're talking about a failed leadership class. Therefore, I accuse you because in verse 11 you have changed gods. Verse 13, for my people have committed two evils. One, they have forsaken me. Now the word forsake is the same Hebrew word that you know, we get it in Aramaic in Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In which Israel says, you've divorced me. But Jeremiah has God say, no, Israel divorced me. So it's only the metaphor, uh, Im uh, the, the image and the metaphor. And the second evil is that they have dug out cis crack cisterns for themselves and traded crack cisterns for living water. Crack cisterns meaning false gods and false foreign alliances. In verse 17, have you brought this upon yourself by forsaking the Lord your God, that's the same word, verb, by abandoning the covenant? What do you gain by foreign alliances with Assyria and Euphrates? Well, you, you're relying on things that cannot make you safe. You see, if you were writing a contemporary poem, you would say, what are the false reliances that our society, and you line that out that way. And then in verse 19, know this and see that it is evil and bitter for you to forsake, same word. So now you have the word forsake three times, and when you get something three times, uh, verse 13, verse 17, verse 9, so, so the, the, the gist of it all is uh, forsaking covenant, and the argument is that Israel has no future and no identity if it abandons the covenant, which here is treated as marriage. Now, the rest of this chapter, I'll not go through in detail, but I imagine that at the end of verse 19, uh, they, the, the, the response was, how did we do that? We didn't forsake. And then he says, this is amazing. Verse 20, you say, you say, I will not serve. I'm not going to be in covenant with Yahweh. Verse 23, you say, how can you say, I am not defiled, I haven't broken the holiness code. Verse 25, you said, it is hopeless, I love strangers, that means alien gods or alien powers, and I will go after them. Verse 27, you say to a tree, you're my father, you say to a stone, you're my mother, you gave me birth. You say to a tree and a stone or some other commodity, come and save me. Verse 31, you say, we are free, we will not come to you anymore. Verse 35, you say, I am innocent. 
Surely his anger has turned from me. And the end of the poem says, I'm just, uh, Yahweh says in verse 26, I'll just give you up to Egypt. I'll let, I'll let them take you over. I'm not going to protect you anymore. I am done with you. So that's sort of final. Now, if you say, you say, you say, you say, you say, they no doubt said to Jeremy, well, we never said anything like that. He said, yeah, you say it in your policies. You say it in your practices. You don't say it with your mouth. You say it by the way you've organized your social life. You say. And that's going to bring the destruction. Now, the next chapter's worse. <laughs> so I want you to know that I know that. Hold that and look at Deuteronomy 24. Very patriarchal. This is, this is a law from Moses, commandment. Uh, 24.1, Deuteronomy is easy to find, be easier than Hosea. <laughs> Suppose a man enters into marriage with a woman, but she does not please him, which means finds out she's not a virgin probably. And he divorces her, and she goes off to be another man's wife. She remarries. Then suppose the second husband, which would be Baal in the, in the metaphor. It's not a metaphor here, it's a commandment. Uh, also divorces her. Her first husband is not permitted to take her back again. That's why you get systematic rape with armies. They go in and they rape the women because then the women are defiled and cannot go back to their husbands. So the second sexual relations with the second husband makes her ineligible to go back. That's the law in patriarchal society. Now what Jeremiah does, he does a riff on that commandment. And I want you to follow it all the way through. Jeremiah 3, if a man divorces his wife, that is, if Yahweh, if, uh, Yahweh divorces Israel, and she becomes an, another man's wife, will he return? No. Deuteronomy, Moses said, no, no. Well, then you have greatly polluted the land. You are defiled. Would you return to me? You can't do it. The Torah says you can't. Verse Two, it gets worse. You are like a nomad in the wilderness looking for somebody to copulate with. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. You have polluted. Therefore, it's just poetry. Therefore, there'll be a drought. Spring rains withheld. Then in verses 6 through 10, you have a prose interpretation. But look at, look at verse 11 or 12. Return, faithless Israel. If you read this in light of Deuteronomy 24, Yahweh is breaking the Torah out of love. You are defiled and cannot come back to me. Return. Verse 14, return. Then you have a prose interpretation in 15 to 18. And then you get some of the pathos of God. I thought how you would call me, and he switches imagery to uh, parent-child, I thought you would say, my father. I thought you would say, thanks, dad. But instead, verse 20, you've been faithless. Verse 22, return, and I will heal your faithlessness. Chapter 4, verse 1, if you return, if you return to me, if you are willing to come back to our covenant, then come back, verse 2, in truth, justice, and uprightness. That is, if you come back, plan to be faithful. Now, this is, this is poetry. It's not doctrine. So the, the 
poet is off on a fancy through the prism of this metaphor is saying that God is so angry. They don't want anything to do with it. They're just going to let Israel fend for itself, which it cannot do. But then Yahweh interrupts Yahweh. That's what poems can do. They can do anything. Stuff can happen in poetry. And right in the middle of this rage, softly and tenderly come home, come home. You are weary, come home. So then you gotta ask, how are you gonna how are you gonna handle a poem that is an invitation wrapped in ferocious rejection. Do you see how the theology of the church simply has been all wrong when it has taught us that God is all-powerful and all-knowing and all-present? In the imagination of Israel, God is an emotive agent who has a wide spectrum of emotional possibility. And I think that the reason the poet does that is that he is convinced that we do not live at a rational idea level, but we really make our elemental decisions at an emotive level underneath. You may, have, you may have seen a new book that got a lot of play called The Righteous Mind in which this guy has made a big study of ethics and he concluded that people do not make rational decisions. They are propelled uh, by all kinds of uh, wounds and hopes and so is God. So if you, if you read it that way, it makes a difference if we are made in the image of this God. We are made in the image of a God who is engaged with wound and possibility and who exposes God's self to the crisis of a relationship that is broken. And I think the poem intends us to be haunted and vexed by where we find ourselves. Well, that's all I have to say about that for now. You can see there's much more there. Any response you want to make to that? Yes. I guess as I was listening to this, the two words codependent just sort of jumped out at me. It's like yep. God and Israel are making each other crazy. I mean, yeah. And it's maybe outside of that that things can be made new, but I mean... It's yeah. Well, the, the, the hope of codependency is that both parties may arrive at freedom from each other. And that's, that's the struggle that's going on in this metaphor and image, I think. That, that is, it was an act of, it was an act of huge freedom on Yahweh's part to say, come home. That, that I am not, I am not bound by these old rules of conduct, but my largeness of reach opens up new possibilities. I think that's a very helpful way to put it. Yep. But you see what, what, the, what, the, what the Bible would say is uh, it can fall into codependency, uh, but we're stuck with this relationship. And, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, percentage of people in our society who say they have no religious preference uh, are people who are deciding uh, they can live outside this set of images and relationships. But here we are. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes? Adam was supposed to be tending the garden and keeping the wolves out. Yep. In this case, this big snake out. Yep. And so 
it's almost like women are the victims <coughs> in society in the sense that as its standards decrease, we are the first to show it. Well, I think that's right. Uh, in a, and in a patriarchal society, it's no doubt the case. So in the book of Genesis, if a couple can't have a baby, it's the woman who's barren. Mm -hmm. they never, they never, it never occurred to them that maybe the, uh, the man was sterile, mm -hmm. Abraham or any of them. Yeah. 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 Well, the second metaphor, that'd be easier. <laughs> the second metaphor There, there that all is. There, that all is. The second uh, metaphor is war. So what you get in chapters four, five, and six are war poems in which God has permitted and unleashed Assyria and then Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, to invade Jerusalem. And the argument of the poetry is this is happening because Yahweh has unleashed them. So if you look in chapter 4, um, verse 5, um, blow the trumpet. Uh, this, is, this is a civil defense warning. <laughs> Raise a standard, flee for safety, evacuate the city, for I am bringing evil from the north, a great destruction. A lion, the lion is Assyria or Babylon. A lion has gone up from the thicket, a destroyer of nations. He has gone forth from his place and your city will be made ruins. Well, it's not an announcement of a war. It's trying to get his listeners to sense that their really foolish actions have inescapable consequences. And if you play the foreign power game, so they were busy making alliances like John Foster Dulles, if you, if, you, if you play the alliance game, it's going to get you because it is not reliance upon Yahweh as a covenant partner. Now, of, of these, the, the one I think is uh, most interesting, uh, verse uh, 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 512, they have spoken falsely of Yahweh, bad, bad liturgy. They have said, don't worry about Yahweh, he won't do anything. No evil will come on us and we will not see covenant curses of sword and famine. That's what they said, quote. Nah, the prophets who say that are nothing but hot air. Therefore, verse 14, therefore, thus says Yahweh the God of the troops, because the prophets have spoken my word falsely. I am now making my words a fire in the mouth of Jeremiah. And this people is wood, dry wood, and fire shall devour them. I, Yahweh, am going to bring upon you a nation from far away. You know about Babylon or Assyria? depending on when you date it. It is an enduring nation. It is a nation, an ancient nation. It is a nation whose language you do not understand. Nor can you understand what they say. It sounds like Al-Qaeda, for God's sake. And they are huge. They are so ominous. Their quiver that they carry their arrows in is like a sepulcher. And all of them are mighty warriors. And they shall devour your harvest and your food. They shall devour your sons and your daughters. They shall devour your flocks and your herds. They shall devour your vines and your fig trees. And they shall destroy your fortified cities. 
Well, maybe, maybe when they heard that poem, they were, they were supposed to ask, uh, can we escape this? We certainly, we are not powerful enough to resist. Jeremiah does not tell them, but it must have raised a question about are there alternative policies and practices? So what he's doing is uprooting uh, their sense of security as God's chosen people. And what he's telling them is that being God's chosen people or the most godly nation in the world does not exempt you from the requirements of covenant. And you cannot outflank the require, requirements of covenant no, how, no matter how fast and how strong you are. Or in um, uh, chapter 6 verses 22 to 23, behold, the 25, uh, 622, behold, a people is coming from the north, a great nation from the end of the earth. And look at this. They grasp the bow and the javelin. They are cruel. And they have no mercy. And their sound of their horses is like a roaring ocean against you, Jerusalem. This is really heavy stuff. Third metaphor was eat up, eat up, eat up. He said, I did do a little homework. Yep. Who's talking? Yes. Would this have been written before or after 587? The assumption is it's before. No. It's, it's, it's before they're, they are not they are not predicting prophets do not predict prophets describe what they think is happening and what is happening is that you're under assault even if you don't know it yet what is happening is you're on your way to destruction sometimes they want to say, why well, don't repent? And sometimes it seems that the poetry says, it's too late. The die is cast. It's, nothing can be done. So poets, I think poets do not write to instruct. I think poets do poetry, good poets, and not particularly the kind Garrison Keillor re reports on every day, but, but good poets. <laughs> Good poets produce poetry because they cannot help themselves. They just get out. And you know, when you're addressed by such poetry, uh, you can take of it what you want, or you can take none of it. But I think the question for a poet always uh, is. How do you penetrate the ideology that protects us to get in touch with the raw reality? And I think what these war poems want to talk about uh, is uh, you are under threat and you can practice all the denial you want to, but you are under threat. And the reason you are under threat says he, is that the world is organized so you cannot get outside the requirement of fidelity. You cannot. Well, then you have to talk about what fidelity means. I think that's the way the argument works. Anybody else want on that? Yep. Are you speaking of the ideology of the Torah? Pardon me? Are you speaking of the ideology of the Torah in this case, or just anyone's? No, I'm talking about the, the ideology of uh, of Jerusalem, chosen king, chosen temple, chosen city. It was the ideology of chosenness or exceptionalism that that was that was the liturgical 
assumption in the Jerusalem temple. The best, the best known statement of that ideology is in Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble, therefore we will not fear. Though the earth totter and fall, though the kingdoms rage and roar, we will not fear. The God, though the God of Jacob is with us, the Lord of hosts is our refuge. Voila! So what you have is an incredible disruption of dominant ideology. Mostly this ideology is not explicit, it's kept under the table. So what they do is to, is to expose this hidden ideology as being a script for self-destruction. And it, what, 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 a, what an incredible enterprise to say the chosenness of David will not maintain the monarchy, the chosenness of Solomon will not maintain the temple, the chosenness of Jerusalem will not maintain the city. It is no wonder that in chapter 38, um, Jeremiah is called a traitor. What the Hebrew says is he is weakening the hands of the king. He is, he is undermining the war effort. <laughs> when you see that. So you got to shush people like that. Because we, we, can't, we can't continue to keep the ideology credible if you have people running around saying crazy things that are unacceptable. You want to come back at that? I don't consider a prophecy of war ideology, except I, I guess I never thought of it from this perspective that it was the PC of the time to be to be considered chosen. Of course it was. That, that's the grounding of David and Solomon and the whole Jerusalem operation. And by and large, the, the managers of dominant ideology intend not to allow any voices to the contrary. So it was the idea of exclusivity or the idea that it was a God-given thing? Well, it's a God-given thing. Now, you can decide whether it was God-given or whether that's a fabrication to support a certain economic political arrangement. And if it was a God-given thing, then if they had heeded Jeremiah's call, then they could have prevented this? It's the argument. So, so you, you heard me slip in that little word exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if, if we traffic in U.S. exceptionalism, you know, you, when, when you try to extrapolate to contemporaneity, it's very problematic, and I know that, and we all don't agree on that. But if our exceptionalism in the United States uh, is uh, turning out to be uh, debilitating, then we need to have a public conversation about how are we to respond to that. Now, we're not all agreed that exceptionalism is uh, so problematic, but if you, if you follow the analog, that's where you'd come out. So it can be applied to our culture, to this culture? Well, it cannot be applied directly. I don't think you can just say, this text means that. But what these texts do is to feed our imagination so that we can notice and think in ways we wouldn't notice and think if we didn't have this poetry. So that the incredible ambiguity of the liturgy of the church is that uh, the American church has basically signed on with that ideology. But we regularly read these texts that raise questions about it. And then uh, priests and pastors and preachers 
try to negotiate that problematic. And if you were to stand at the door by the preacher on Sunday morning, you would notice people notice thinking outside the ideology very quickly. In which is... In which, a reflection of service? Of what? In a, in a reflection of service? In a reflection of something that got said in the service. Yeah. And that, that, is, that is the incredible struggle of maintaining an institutional church through continuous time. Because you can't build a church on a poetic eruption. <laughs> you gotta, you got to sustain. But one of the purposes of the, of, the, of the sustaining effort is to create an arena where we can host these texts that we mainly don't want to host. So in some ways the lectionary protects us. You won't find too many of these texts in the lectionary. <laughs> So, you have to be very safe to get on the lectionary committee. <laughs> well, Peter, I, one, of, one of the things when we're reading these things where false gods appear, right? and if we want to think about these texts and uh, what we have to learn about our current day society, um, we do need to be honest about what our false gods are today. Because we don't have Baal and we don't have stone images. Right. And uh, uh, but we do have our false gods. And uh, it is very, very difficult for us to admit that to ourselves. It was difficult then. It is diff was difficult then, and it is very, very yep. difficult today. And um, it, it's fairly... I, I, now, let me tell you a story. Um, I, I, I remember a time I was talking to a priest from Africa. He came here and he told me this was the most Christian country in the world. I pulled my wallet out of my back pocket. I waved the 20 in the, in the air, and I said, this is the God of this country. And the man just looked at me. He was dumbfounded. I put the 20 back in my wallet and put it back in my pocket. Was he dumbfounded that you knew, or? or? <laughs> you no, know, he was dumbfounded. He didn't okay. have to give him that at all. Yep. He was just, just looking at the number yep. of people who go to church. Yep. Well, we all, we all could construct a list of what yeah. we think our idols are, and, and we wouldn't agree on them all. Mm -hmm. But but it's uh, and no more, I'm, it's I'm good. Yeah, 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 yep, 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 right yep, yep. And, you know, the, the poetry, <laughs> the poetry doesn't require Jeremiah to make a list. He's not going to give you a list. He's just going to give you metaphors. Mm -hmm. And he says, What's, well, what, is, what does that generate for you? I guess you've noticed how much of the liturgy is in poetry. Have you, have you noticed the language of the Nicene Creed? You cannot tell what those words mean. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. What? what? It's all poetry. What the theologians have done is to try to make it a memo. <laughs> and it won't work. So poetry gives people lots of room. When, when they when they created a United Church of South India, they had Methodists and Disciples and Anglicans, and they got into a big argument about what's our theology of the Eucharist. And they finally decided our theology of the Eucharist is to say, this is my body, this is my bread. Uh, I didn't get that right, you know what I mean. <laughs> In my blood. It means whatever you think it means because it's poetry. But what the theologians try to do is to <coughs> flatten it. Third image, we'll do these quickly. Jeremiah 8, the third image is, you're stupid. I had a Republican today, my friend. I asked him what he thought about John Boehner. He said, stupid. I didn't because I'm not a Republican, but you know. <laughs> so here, here it is. Uh, chapter 8. 
verse 6, I have given heed and listened, but they do not speak honestly. No one repents, saying, What have I done? All of them turn to their course like a horse plunging into battle. <coughs> what, what was that film called? War Horse? A well, horse doesn't have any sense. It just rushes. And then look at verse 7. <laughs> Even the stork and the turtle dove and the swallow and the crane and the robins and the hummingbirds and the, what is it, swallows of Capistrano? They all know what time it is. But my people are dumb in the bird. <laughs> now there's a second text, like look at Isaiah 1. Just for fun. Verse 1-3. Th the ox knows its owner and the donkey knows its master's crib. A any of you who've been on a farm know that cows can be in the pasture, but at 5 o'clock they head for the barn. It's milking time. They know. Nobody has to call them. But Israel does not know. Israel is so stupid. Doesn't understand anything. Israel does not know what time it is. It is time for repentance. It is time for death. Fourth image is sickness. You remember John Dean's famous statement to Richard Nixon? In which he says there's a cancer in your government. Little did he, or well, maybe he did know. This poem you know a little bit of in chapter 8. God says, uh, verse 18, my joy is gone, grief is upon me, my heart is sick. Listen for the cry of my poor people. My poor people who find all this disaster coming say, is the Lord with us or not? Is the Lord in Zion? Is the king not in Jerusalem? And then they say, this, this verse, was, verse 20 was written for the Cub fans. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. <laughs> For the hurt of my poor people, God says, is there no medicine in Gilead? Yes, there is. Is there no doctor? Oh, yes, there is. Why then has the health of my poor people not been restored? Because they are so, so sick. You know, the, the spiritual says there is a bomb in Gilead, but the text doesn't. The text says, is there? And then God says, Oh, that I had bigger tear ducts, <laughs> that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of my poor people. So you have my poor people in verse 19, my poor people in verse 21, my poor people in verse... Uh, uh, one, the poor people that are sick unto death and they don't know it. God says, "Oh, that I had a, that I had a cottage at uh, Proctor Campground, so I could get away from all these people, for they're all unfaithful and fickle liars, and they don't tell the truth, and they go from evil to evil, and they don't acknowledge me." Well, you're not talking about people that have cancer or diabetes. It's a metaphor. It's a metaphor that if you're sick enough, long enough, you're going to die. So, there are more. We were dealt with horror, war, stupidity, sickness. All ways of talking about broken covenant that has consequences. 
therefore. So the prophets do not predict. They anticipate that it, that means destruction, is coming upon us. They weep ahead of time. They try to penetrate the ideology of chosenness, Israel, exceptionalism, does not give a pass on covenantal requirements toward God or toward neighbor. And what they thought, if they silenced the poet, it wouldn't happen here. Yeah, this is an old text. It's not addressed to us. But good literature, particularly if it's inspired literature, keeps addressing us. Now, if you, if you find this collage of metaphors offensive or hard to take, you got it. <laughs> it's a plant, it's plucking up and tearing down so that the intention of this collage, I think, is to make Jeremiah's listeners uneasy with the easy certitudes out of which they wanted to live. And as I said uh, the first hour, uh, I think this is just ad hoc poetry. But there is an editorial process then has brought this stuff together and tried to give it some uh, rough coherence. Yes, Bob. Yeah, the, the question for me is, you know, how do you interpret the metaphor? Uh, a more modern interpretation of this might be saying, if you follow or, uh, follow uh, false values, the wrong values, bad things are likely to happen. And if you follow good values, or uh, things are bad things are less likely to happen. Uh, but it seems to be saying more as that God is the primary actor in everything, including evil. Seems to be. I mean, it is. It is the prophetic discourse assumes the agency of God, so they talk that way. Yeah. Now, what liberals try to do is to see: is it possible to say this? without being so primitive as to appeal to the agency of God. And you could do that. You could talk about cause and effect. But, but he, doesn't, he doesn't use that language. He doesn't just say, you do this, it produces that. He puts between cause and effect the agency of God who is capable of ferocious anger and winsome pathos. And uh, the, the, the problem with, re, with eliminating the agency of God, you haven't got much to talk about when you get to Jesus. Because we confess that Jesus is God's agent. And we say the defining agent in a long sequence of agents. Uh, but it is the language in which it is cast, and I think we have to, we have to pay attention to that language. How to make it contemporary, uh, we, all, we all do that, if we listen, we all do that every time we hear a text. There is no right move. There are many possible moves, and we all make the moves that we are capable of making. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, I I, th I think of, in this case, the idea of God luring, you know, you are supposed to have some free, free will, um, of God luring us as opposed to forcing us. Yeah. It's, a, it, it's sort of like, but if you, you us, but yeah. it be more, yeah. a more direct agent. Yeah. Because it seemed like what they're saying back there is that 
if you are true to God, he will, God will protect you. Well, in order to protect you, he must be in some kind of control of things. So if, if, if Syria comes down and attacks you, it's not just because you did the, you know, you made a bad alliance or something like that. It's because God in, unleashed it yeah. on you. Yeah. So then you have to ask, is that the way you want to say it? Or can you think of another way to say it? Well, I don't know. If you, or, or do you want to say international politics is just a tale told by an idiot signifying nothing? <laughs> we don't believe that. You know, but, but any way you say it is hugely problematic, which is our work. Wow, there's a little to chew on for the next week. Um, thank you, Walter, and uh, thank you all for coming. Now, uh, just a reminder that next week we will again have potluck. I want to say this again, even if you don't cook anything, you can come. Uh, we don't uh, charge you, we don't make a note that you came and you didn't bring any food. <laughs> and uh, we just love to have you. We'll start here at uh, 7 and do look uh, on the website if you want to see last week's and the next, this one will come up uh, uh, soon. Let us pray. God, we would just as soon have you be very docile and not in play. And tonight you have challenged us to believe that you are ferocious and active and always up to something, maybe even no good. So help us to pay attention to you, help us to be open to you, help us to argue with you, and help us to see things that we simply have never seen before through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good night. <laughs>